In the previous parts, we focused on the network editor and the device editor. In this part, we're going to further break it down into two sections. The first section is going to focus on how code is structured for Siemens PLCs. The next section is going to focus on the code editor itself. So to access your code, all you need to do is click on the down arrow in the project tree for the PLC that you want to work on, and then find the program blocks folder and click the down arrow. As you can see, we have many different program blocks in our project. These first three, the ones with the pink, green, and light blue icons, are where your code is actually contained. For example, I can open up one of these blocks, and then I can see the code within that block. In this case, I opened up what's called an organization block, or OB for short. An organization block is called by the PLC itself. It is the bridge between the system code running in the PLC, which you cannot edit, and the user code, which you do edit. Therefore, all the code in your project will originate from some sort of OB. An organization block can take on many forms. The most important is going to be your main routine otherwise known as OB1. This is where most of your code will originate from. It is this routine that it is called cyclically by the PLC and its execution time depends solely on the code that it is running. Other OBs include the startup task, which is run once when the PLC goes from stop mode to run mode. The cyclic interrupt, which will run uh, every time this cyclic timer elapses. The hardware interrupt, anytime that there's a hardware failure throughout uh, your system. A rack failure, anytime there's a problem with communication. Or for instance, a time of day instruction, where I can have a piece of code run at a given time every day, every week, or so forth. Now in theory, I can write all of my code for my project using just organization blocks. However, if I did that, it would be a nightmare. My code would be very disorganized because it would all be in one place, there, so there would be no structure to it. And also, it would be very uh, time consuming to have to rewrite code again and again for repetitive tasks. Therefore, we have these two blocks, the function and the function block. A function is a container of code that does not maintain its own memory area. Whereas a function block is also a container of code, but this does retain uh, its memory internally. So for example, if I wanted to record the average temperature of a motor throughout the day, I would want to use a function block. In that, I would sum up the temperature every time it's called, and then at the end of the day, I can divide by the number of samples. I would use a function for something a bit more momentary, like converting that temperature from Celsius to Fahrenheit. Now imagine that I have 100 motors in my system, and I want to record the average temperature for each and every one of them. This is the real beauty of function and function blocks. I only have to write the code in one place, and then I can call it for as many motors as I have. So it's only one place where I have to maintain my code, as opposed to if I wrote it in an organization block, I'd have to write that code a hundred times. So in order to record the average temperature from one motor to the next motor, that data has to be retained individually. And that data is retained in what's called a data block, as indicated by the blue cylinder. A data block is basically a container of data. When it is used in conjunction with a function block, uh, it is known as an instance data block. And that can be shown here. It, it has an input field, output field, and for the variables used in the middle of the function block, uh, they're known as static variables. When a data block is used for structure and organizational purposes, it is known as a global data block. In a global data block, you can use the data here in any part of your PLC code. 
The data block is one of two areas where data can be stored in your PLC. The other area is under PLC tags. PLC tags are where your inputs and outputs are stored. Your inputs are indicated by this I address and your outputs are indicated by a Q address. This is also where your RAM memory or working memory gets stored and that's indicated by an M address. There are several advantages a data block has over storing your data here. For one, in a data block, we can retain our data. We can also have complex structures and arrays within a data block. You cannot do that within a tag table. So in a tag table, the memory data is stored to RAM. That means if the PLC is powered off, this data could be lost. In order to fix this, you can assign an area of memory to be retained. To do that, click on this X icon here and then give a size for the amount of memory you would like to have retained. Notice that there is a limit. So for instance, I'll type in 20 here and we'll see that some memory tags that are between 0 and 20 are retained, but the ones higher than 20 are not. If I would like to retain a piece of data in a data block, all I need to do is open it and then press retain. Some additional advantages of data blocks is I can give each data point a starting value. This means that if the data is run for the first time, it will begin with this value. If I do not have retain selected, then every time the PLC is powered on, the data point will default back to my start value. If I do have retain selected, then the data will simply become what it was when the PLC was powered off. Another advantage of the data block is I can record a snapshot of the values when I'm online with the PLC. With that snapshot, I can then move those values to my start value, or later on I can uh, move them to the actual value of all these data points.